In this video, I'm going to be looking at the orthogonality properties of trig functions. And so what that means is that I'm going to be evaluating uh, these three integrals. So every combination of sine and cosine, so here cosine nx, cosine mx, uh, over this interval minus pi to pi. And I'm going to be doing each of these three integrals in three different ways. So you know th there are a lot of different ways that we can do these integrals. Um, but my, my goal is going to be, you know, since we're doing all three of them, might as well uh, use a different technique for each one. Uh, so let's get started. So for this first integral, this first integral up here is actually, and I'll, I'll write it down again right here, uh, integral minus pi to pi cosine of nx sine of mx dx. Uh, this one is actually the easiest to solve out of all of them because you'll notice that uh, cosine is not is an even function, sine is an odd function, and we're integrating this over this even inter interval, so from minus pi to pi. And so uh, what that tells us immediately is that this integral is always going to be equal to zero, and it's always going to be equal to zero because uh, the integral from zero to pi is going to be exactly equal to the integral from minus pi to zero. Um, and so if that argument doesn't quite make sense, then we can we can be a little more strict about it. So we can rewrite this as integral minus pi to zero cosine of nx sine of mx plus, and I'll write this right below, integral zero to pi, um, same thing, cosine of nx sine of mx dx. Okay. Um, so far so good. And then for this top line, what we can do is we can use a change of variables. So we can take x to minus x. And when we do that, what we get is, okay, um, x goes to minus x, so we have integral, well, uh, we're changing x to minus x, so this becomes uh, pi to zero. Um, but we have a minus sign on this dx, so here we can, we can just flip the bounds of integration like this. And then we have cosine of minus nx sine of minus mx dx plus and then this same yeah, this same line right here but you'll notice that since cosine's even uh, we can take this minus sign to be a, a plus sign because you know fl flipping cosine doesn't do anything but uh sine's odd and so that means that this minus sign right here we can bring out in front and then we see that okay this integral right here is actually just equal to minus this integral right here uh, and so this whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, uh, good. First one down. That one wasn't too bad. Let's do the second one. So the, for the next one, we have integral minus pi to pi cosine of nx times cosine of mx dx. And so uh, we can't use the same trick as before because now we have two even functions. Uh, so this integral will not be zero in general. Um, so what I'm going to do in order to evaluate this is I'm going to use a trig property. And the property that I'm going to use is that uh, this argument right here, cosine nx cosine mx, is equal to it's equal to one half times cosine of nx minus mx uh, plus cosine of nx plus mx, and then this whole thing times dx. And so this is this is a great trick property to use here, because we've, we've exchanged this product of cosines for a sum of two cosines, and we know how to take the integral of a single cosine, uh, so this becomes much easier. So first uh, we integrate this cosine right here, and we get sine of, and I'm going to pull out the x, so we have x times n minus m, all divided by n minus m, plus sine of x times n plus m, n plus m, and then that's again divided by n plus m, and then we're evaluating this, this whole thing at minus pi and pi, minus pi to pi. Okay, uh, good, so we can then write this, uh, and I'll maybe move this, I'll maybe move up here. So we can then uh, evaluate this at the endpoints, and what we get is um, one half.
sine of So we can evaluate this at the endpoints and you know, do a little bit of math. And what we find is that this is equal to, this is equal to sine of pi times n minus m divided by n minus m plus sine of pi times n plus m divided by n plus m. Okay. So uh, that's what we get from evaluating uh, this integral at the, at the uh, boundary points, at the endpoints. And so the last thing to do now is to interpret this result. So, so what, what is, what, what's going on here? Well, implicitly, and I, I suppose I haven't said it explicitly, but we're, we're assuming here that n and m are integers, so, so whole numbers. Um, and so that's convenient because we know that sine is equal to 0 at integers times pi. So at you know zero pi two pi minus pi um, at all those at all those values sine is equal to zero, and so what that tells us is that uh, each of these each of these comp uh, each of these parts of this uh, solution are going to be equal to zero pretty much for every single value of n and m right because for any value of n and m we're just going to get another integer times pi. Okay, um, there's one exception though. There's there's one there's one time where this is broken, and that's the case where the denominator is also equal to zero, because in that case we have zero on top divided by zero on bottom, um, and zero over zero that means that we need to uh, we need to take the limit, or in this case what we're going to do is we're going to use L'Hopital's rule. So um, let's start with uh, this first term right here. So I'm going to use a new variable. I'm going to say let's let n minus m equal Epsilon, and, and we could have called it anything, right? We could have called it uh, x. We could have called it, you know, x prime. You know, pick pick whatever variable you want. Here, I'm going to call it epsilon because it's a it's a small quantity. And so, in this case, we have uh, sine of pi times epsilon divided by epsilon. Now, if we use L'Hopital's rule, uh, that tells us to uh, that the limit as this thing goes to zero is going to be equal to of the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. And so we can differentiate the top. We're going to get pi times cosine of pi epsilon divided by, well, derivative of just epsilon is 1, since we're differentiating with respect to epsilon here. OK, um, last but not least, uh, we're taking the limit where epsilon goes to 0. And so this whole thing here uh, just becomes pi. OK, great. Um, so what we see then is that this whole this whole integral right here is equal to well we have a couple different cases so it's equal to pi if n is equal to m right so we just showed that if n is equal to m then this term right here gives us a pi if n is equal to minus m so then we're looking at this term right here so uh, we we can repeat the same analysis and we find that we get the exact same answer so. If n is equal to minus m, we get pi. Uh, there's this special case um, that we talked about before where um, n is not equal to m or minus m, right? Because then, then we just have pi times an integer in both of these numerators and then a non-zero denominator. And so um, that gives us a zero. Uh, but there's also this special case, this special case where n is equal to m, but it's also equal to zero. So in that case, uh, this first term is going to return pi, right? Because we have n equal to m, 0 equals 0. But the second term is also going to return pi because, you know, n is equal to minus m, 0 is equal to 0 also works. And so in that case, both of these terms add together and we get 2 pi. So 2 pi for n equals m equals 0. Good. Okay. Uh, so we've we've done this second integral then. So so we, we know that this first integral, cosine times sine, uh, that's always going to give us zero. The second one, cosine and cosine, um, that's going to give us zero if n and m are uh, not equal to each other or not equal to minus each other. And then if they're equal to each other, so if we have n equals m or n equals minus m, then we get pi. And if they're both equal to zero, then we get 2 pi. Okay. Uh, Lastly, we have this third integral right here, sine, sine of nx times sine of mx. So I'll write that down right here. So we have integral 
minus pi to pi sine of nx sine of mx dx. And there are a couple of different ways of evaluating this. So one would just be to use the same type of trig property that we used before here, right? So, so here we use this trig property where we were able to rewrite um, this product of, product of cosines as a sum of cosines. So that's a, that's a perfectly valid way of doing this and, and it's maybe the easiest thing to do here. Um, but if you're like me, and maybe you don't always remember your trig, then one trick that you can do to, to simplify this a bit is to rewrite the sine of x using Euler's formula. So, so recall that Euler's formula gives us that e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine of x. And what this means is that we can, uh, we can take the imaginary part of this expression in order to get sine of x. And uh, if we do that, what we find is that sine of x, sine of x is equal to e to the i x minus e to the minus i x divided by 2 i. Okay, and, and you can just plug in uh, Euler's formula uh, for e to the i x right here to confirm this. Okay. Um, so what's the idea here? You know, what, what are we actually doing here? Well, the idea is that integrating exponential functions is much easier than integrating trig functions, right? I mean, if, if you gave me some some funky integral with, you know, sine times a cosine times another sine, you know, I'm not going to know how to do that without, you know, whipping out a table of trig identities and sort of going through that and trying really hard to simplify things. But um, I know how to integrate exponentials because those combine in a very simple way, right? If we if we multiply two exponentials, then we just add the um, their arguments, and so that's going to be the idea here. So we can rewrite these signs right here in terms of complex exponentials. So we have well, we have a one over two uh, i from this term. So one over two i. Then we have e to the i and x minus e to the minus i and x and we're multiplying that by uh, this term right here which is another one over two i multiplying let me, let me uh make that a little prettier one over two i times okay same same rule e to the i m x minus e to the minus i m x and then, uh, now that we have this, we can just distribute the terms. So uh, we do that, and we do that, and what we get is that this is equal to, uh, so 1 over 2i, 1 over 2i, that gives us uh, minus 1 over 4, integral minus pi to pi. And then we have e to the ix times n plus m minus e to the i x times n minus m minus e to the minus i x n minus m plus e to the minus i x n plus m. Okay, uh, so this is kind of a mess right here and, and not just because of how I, I wrote this. And we're running out of space, so I'll, I'll scroll down a little bit. So what we can notice here is that we have um, something special going on. So we have an e to the i x n plus m and an e to the minus i x n plus m. And likewise, we have i minus e to the i x n minus m and an e to the minus i x n minus m. And so these right here are, are actually expressions for cosine. So we can, uh, in the same way that we got this expression for sine of x, we can get a similar one for cosine of x, where we have cosine of x is equal to e to the i x plus e to the minus i x over 2. And once again, you can just plug in uh, e to the i x here uh, in Euler's formula to see that this is true. Um, so this is great news because what it means is that we can rewrite, uh, we can rewrite this, this integral here in terms of cosine. And if we do that, what we see is that uh, this integral is equal to minus 1 over 2 integral minus pi to pi 
cosine of x times n plus one uh, n plus m minus cosine of x times n minus m. This is actually just an expression of this same type of trig identity here. So we've we've sort of rederived this trig identity uh, just from complex exponentials. And so this is sort of convenient if you're if you're maybe not too familiar with trig identities. Um, you know, you you know that you can always just use uh, exponential functions and get out the same result. So that's sort of a nice trick to, to have and to be able to use sometimes. Um, but um, now that we're here, we can we can wrap this up because we know how to integrate cosines. So uh, we, we integrate these cosines and we get minus one half times sine of x times n plus m divided by n plus m minus sine of x times n minus m, the whole thing divided by n minus m. And this is evaluated from minus pi up to pi. Okay, and uh, once again, uh, this is exactly in the same form as this integral we had before with cosine and cosine. And uh, what we saw in that case was that for, a, for a certain special values of n and m, we can use L'Hopital's rule in order to uh, in order to determine what these are equal to, right? Because for, for most choices of n and m, these will give you zero, but for a couple special cases, we have zero over zero. And so just like in the previous case, we have, uh, we get pi for n is equal to m. We have some extra minus signs here. And so uh, we have minus pi then for n equal to minus m. So, so you, you can work this out and you see that you get an extra minus sign there. Uh, then uh, you get zero when n is not equal to m. But you also have um, one difference. So in, in the previous case, uh, since we had, since, um, since these integrals both gave pi for n equals m and n equals minus m for the case where we were integra integrating two cosines, that meant that in the case where we had n equals m equals zero, both of those pi's added up and we got two pi. But in this case, we have pi and we have minus pi. And so what that means is that in the case where n equals m equals zero, uh, this pi adds to this minus pi and we get zero again. So we have zero, not just for n equal or, or n not equal to m, but also for n equals m equals zero. Okay, uh, so we've, we've done it then. So what we've done is we've, we've evaluated these three integrals up here and we've seen that uh, trick functions have this special property where if we're integrating from minus pi to pi, um, then for the vast majority of our choices of n and m, these integrals equal zero. And then for a handful of special cases, so in the special cases where n is equal to m or minus m or sometimes zero, uh, you get out these special values of pi or two pi. And this ends up being a very, very, uh, very important property of trig functions and, and goes on to be used extensively uh, in Fourier series. And so so this, this fact right here sort of ends up forming in part, the, the basis for, for how you're able to uh, derive and use Fourier series. But um, I'll leave that for another video, and I think I'll stop here.